Hello, I'm Dr. Muscle, and welcome to part two of lecture 13 on virtue ethics. We'll pick up our discussion of virtue ethics and our discussion of Aristotle, uh, more specifically what he has to say regarding uh, morality. So a quick review of our first video, part one, we talked about you know who Aristotle was, uh, obviously an important figure in the history of philosophy. We talked about virtue ethics in general. We tried to start off very generally and talk about some of its general points of emphasis, you know, what matters, that idea of character, our habits, our behavior over time. And uh, as we've then continued from that point forward, we fleshed out, you know, how that's the case, um, the ways in which our behavior over time is what matters, that idea of the big picture. Uh, eudaimonia, or I had to write that up there so I remember how to say it this time around, um, that Greek term, we talked a lot about that, which is kind of the end all be all of all human behavior, right? It, we ought to strive to reach this state of flourishing in a sustained sort of way. Eudaimonia, again, that Greek term. And we talked about how that's going to require then, insofar as we get there, because many people don't ever get there. It's a very difficult process. That's going to require uh, persistent rational reflection on our part. You, get, you see some similarities with um, Epicurus here too, right? With this notion that we're going to have to um, constantly engage in you know, reflection in this idea that prudence is key, right? Constantly engage in reflection and reflect on our character to ensure that we are um, sticking to the best path to eudaim eudaimonia. Yes. Okay. So, and we, uh, we talked a little bit about, you know, the idea of virtue ethics. One of the central themes is that it's an inexact science. Uh, we can't spell it exactly what uh, doing the right thing looks like for you because it it changes amongst people right that idea of the golden mean and uh, we can tell you that you ought to, to shoot for moderation in whatever you do but there's this idea that um, what that moderate amount looks like varies across people and not only that as i tried to emphasize across you know uh, one's own lifetime what's going to lead to this could very well change uh and so we talked about again that sort of flexibility and how that's completely at odds with someone like Kant, who's very rigid in his sense of morality and whatever applies, remember it's rooted in reason and is therefore thought to be sort of uh, objective and applicable to all rational creatures, regardless of their time and uh, the time in which they exist or, you know, where in space they happen to, to exist. You know, um, this applies absolutely to these moral standards and truths and Aristotle's the opposite. And we talked about how then some people find that to be a source of criticism then because, you know, the idea is he doesn't um, offer enough guidance, you know, in saying that it's an inexact. But I've already mentioned, as we concluded the part one video by discussing, he does offer this idea, famous idea of the golden mean, this notion that we're probably all familiar with before we even came to this ethics course, this idea of moderation being key. Okay, so again, we concluded with our discussion of that. It doesn't matter who you are, an Olympic athlete, or an average Joe Blow, there's a sense in which you can eat too much, right, or eat too little. And so, too, it doesn't matter who you are, a soldier fighting in a war or an average Joe Blow, there's a sense in which you can act fearlessly too much and obviously too little as well. Okay. So then that brings us to the part two. Uh, what we'll do then in this video, we'll talk about some of the practical implications of the theory, uh, some of the peripheral points that he brings up. Um, some practical tips that he offers us as well. So to that criticism that it's too, uh, it doesn't offer us enough guidance. You know, he does offer some, you know, tips, if you will. So we'll talk about some of those. Uh, we'll talk about how to identify the virtuous character, the truly virtuous character. We see something being done. Is Was that indicative of a virtuous character? Well, it depends. We have to know a few things. We'll talk about that. We'll talk about uh, how we ought to go about figuring out who's morally praiseworthy and blameworthy, you know, how, in what sense we ought to think about this notion of moral responsibility. We'll talk about that and we'll conclude with uh, uh, sort of an elaboration on some criticism. So we already have mentioned um, one, uh, right, this sense in which it doesn't offer us enough guidance, but we'll pick up on a few other criticisms as well. So with that said, let's go ahead and proceed then. So we are starting with slide 14. Uh, a couple, I guess, peripheral points, if you will. I labeled the slide important points. They are indeed important. We have this notion that virtue perpetuates virtue. This idea that 
the more virtuous you are now, the more likely you are to be virtuous in the future. Uh, you know, whatever habits become ingrained, well, then they're going to become more and more ingrained. I guess the idea is more and more ingrained, the more they're done, right? So, uh, and our science bears this out. And this is something that all the ancient philosophers, or many of them, you know, at least Aristotle and Plato for sure, seem to, and Socrates, seem to recognize that's the importance of our youth and how changing our behavior and our habits over time, that becomes more and more difficult. And our science, our studies, you know, in more recent times, that seems to, to bear that out, right? To support that idea that as we become older, it becomes more and more difficult to change our ways, our ways of thinking and our ways of behaving. We become more and more ingrained in the habits that have been established. So in view of that, these, these ancients, um, again, very reflective dudes, right? They realize, they seem to realize this. And so they, you have this persistent um, emphasis on their part to get in and mold the minds of the youth at a very early age, this um, emphasis on how important childhood education is. That we need to, so Aristotle points out, right, that we need to get in and start molding the, the, the minds of the youth at an early age so that then, given this point, right, that they'll start acting uh, in a virtuous manner, establish, establishing virtuous habits at an earlier age so that those become more and more ingrained. And it's not, and it's, a, so too, it's an easier process when they're young and fledgling, right, because they, they don't have these deeply ingrained habits in, in place yet. So we want to get in while that's still possible to, uh, to tweak their character, if you will, and, and to mold it. Uh, we need to get in there while it's still possible, while they're still pliable and moldable, if you will. And so too, then the earlier we can do that, then they'll have more and more time to sort of reinforce those good habits. Uh, so to back this point up, this is our, from our text 56 to 57. He says, quote, as a result of abstaining from pleasures, we become moderate. And then by so becoming moderate, we're especially able to abstain from them. So it becomes easier. You know, the, the more we act virtuously now, the easier and easier it becomes, and the more likely we are to act virtuously in the future. Okay, another, I, meant, I did not put this up here. Um, he also talks a lot about uh, the connection between virtue and so to vice. Whoops, oh goodness. Virtue and then pleasures and pains. He has some interesting reflections on this. I guess I'll read what he says first and then kind of explain what he, in case it's not clear what he means when he says it. So 57 from the text, both of these quotes come from. He says, quote, the pleasure or pain that accompanies someone's deeds ought to be taken as a sign of his characteristics, end quote. And so what he's getting at there is he's suggesting that we can sort of tell when someone truly has a virtuous character because they feel pleasures at the right time, so to speak, and they feel pains at, uh, at the right times, right? So in other words, he's going to say that they'll feel when virtue, something virtuous is being done, they, they feel pleasure when that's done. And then when something vicious or not virtuous is being done, that pains them. And so you can actually tell what sort of character someone has by when they experience the pleasures and pains, and specifically if those properly correspond to when something virtuous or vicious is being done. So an interesting point there. He also says then, also on 57, quote, moral virtue is concerned with pleasures and pains. It is on account of the pleasure involved that we do base things or vicious things or bad things. And it is on account of the pain that we abstain from noble, noble ones or virtuous ones or good, good things. So what he's getting at, and that's an end, end quote. So what he's getting at is, you know, it's in view of the pleasure we experience that we go out and party instead of studying, right? Or alternatively, it's in view of the pains we experience that we refrain from doing what's noble, in that case, studying, you might say, right? Because that's a painful process. We don't like to, you know, reread and try to understand this difficult stuff. So he's pointing that out, right? That, um, that it's very much um, connected to that. And especially as we're starting off and we has, haven't reached the state of eudaimonia yet. Um, you know, we can be sort of um, manipulated by these pleasures and pains and led, to, led astray by them. Okay. Now, alternatively, as I started off by saying, conversely, if we have a virtuous character and disposition, then we will feel pleasures and pains at the right times. Okay, But he's saying in general, right, what leads people astray? Why don't they do the virtuous thing? Because it's painful sometimes. Studying is painful. You know, getting up and going to work on time every day, that's not necessarily the most enjoyable thing to do. 
Um, why do we do naughty stuff or bad stuff? Because it's pleasurable. It seems pleasurable. Uh, and the bottom of slide 14 is the point I, I guess I already kind of began with, mentioning the importance of, of youth and childhood education. And I like the, the point the editors raise speaks to that as well. Um, they point out that on 47, quote, Aristotle suggests we begin life being prone to vice. So we actually, far from having it, remember that point we mentioned in the last video or the last part, first part, I should say, of the lecture 13 um, video, it's not uh, something we have by nature. It's not like eyesight. Rather, it's something we have to develop and it, it takes the proper habits and so on. That's a moral virtue, right? And he's speaking to that. And in fact, he says, far from having it by nature, this moral virtue, we actually start inclined to do the opposite and to do what's vicious or not proper. Okay? So that's what our tendencies begin as. And then we need the idea is hopefully right, we'll eat, read our ancient philosophers or we'll have good teachers who will then steer us in the proper direction right, and fine tune our habits and explain to us why you know, staying up all night every night isn't going to be good for us, why not brushing our teeth is not a good habit and so on and so forth. So again, back to what the editors point out. Quote, Aristotle suggests we begin life being prone to vice. We need teachers to steer us toward what is good until we come to be able to identify it ourselves. Very important point. Again, it's not something we have by nature. And if, insofar as we ever reach the state of eudaimonia, it's going to take trial and error. Um, we're going to screw up. Okay? We're going to suffer. It's going to be uh, take a lot of reflection and hopefully some guidance from you know, our, our uh, elders who are hopefully a little bit wiser and have engaged in the proper reflection and so on. Okay. okay. So with that said, let's transition into slide 15 where we will, we will raise a very uh, Kantian point. So I mentioned in the part one video that at times virtue ethics and Aristotle's moral theory seems reminiscent of utilitarianism and consequentialism. For example, the general emphasis on flourishing or happiness, eudaimonia, the Greek term, um, right? Definite similarities to the utilitarians. Okay, but we also, as I alluded to in the part one video, we'll see similarities as we're going to see here to Kant and the deontologist. Right? And so he raises a point that's, uh, again, similar to the issue Kant raises with respect to little Sammy helping the little old lady cross the street. How do we know for sure, just because we see something, that's a good habit to help others in need, right? That's in general, that's going to um, probably not put you out too much. They're more likely to reciprocate if all people sort of help each other when, it, when possible. Isn't that going to be a habit that's going to lead to this? For ourselves and then also in turn for others. So ostensibly the point is little Sammy helping little lady cross the street. That seems on the face of it uh, a virtuous thing to do. But like Kant, he wants to say, hold up a second. And so that's why he, what he's getting at on 58 of our text when he says, um, so he makes this analogy to like grammar and speaking correctly. You know, somebody could just accidentally speak correctly. That doesn't mean they actually right, um, should be known as a grammatical expert or thought of in a high regard, right, they could have just done it accidentally. He wants to make the same point then with respect to acting virtuously. Just like Kant wants to say, just because somebody's acting as duty requires, that doesn't mean they're morally praiseworthy. Aristotle is saying the same thing, just because somebody on the face of it seems to be doing something that's morally virtuous, doesn't mean they have a morally virtuous character. Okay. So he says, just as one, and this is from uh, 58, just as one can, quote, do something skillful in letters by chance or on the instructions of another, end quote, the idea is so too one can act in a virtuous manner accidentally or because they were forced into doing so by mom and dad walking behind them or whatever the case might be. Okay. So to be properly deemed virtuous, you have to be doing what's virtuous, uh, no, realizing that it's virtuous, and that has to be why you're doing it. And again, that's very reminiscent, as I point out on the bottom of 15, very reminiscent of what Kant suggests. So on 16, then we outline what I have up here, uh, the true, the three conditions, of, if you will, of a truly virtuous character. So you might think of these as like check boxes. We like to do that. We've done that in the past. Okay, so what are the three conditions of a truly virtuous character? The little Sammy helped the little old lady cross the street. Seems like, you know, uh, some, a virtuous thing to do. Does little Sammy have a virtuous character? It depends. First, as I point out in the first bullet here, Okay. The doer, little Sammy, has to know that what they're doing is virtuous. It's a virtuous thing to do. And I've, I've tried to kind of make the case for that. I right? don't a whole helping others when you can, 
that's probably going to lead to you having a flourishing lifestyle as well. Obviously, it's going to help them and they might reciprocate and so on and so forth. So uh, you have to have that kind of understanding. This sort of habit is a good habit. It's going to lead to flourishing. Okay, it's the virtuous thing to do. But point two, okay, that has to be why you're doing it. It's one thing to recognize this is the right thing to do. It's another thing to be actually, actually be doing it because of that. Right? You might recognize that, uh, you know, doing X is the proper thing to do, but you might still be motivated for selfish reasons, and that's actually why you're doing it. So he's just pointing out. Okay? And again, these are very reminiscent of Kant. Uh, you have to have that knowledge of that what you're doing is, in fact, the virtuous thing to do. Right. And then you have to that's that has to be the motive. That's to be why you're doing it. Okay, Because you understand that on a whole, when you behave in this sort of way habitually, you're going to flourish. Okay? And then third, thirdly, and perhaps the most Aristotelian point, given that big picture emphasis that I've been hammering home throughout both parts of lecture 13 here. It has to not be an anomaly of their character. It has to be indicative of who they are, right? On a whole. In other words, it can't be an, um, it can't be an exception. So little Sammy has to behave this way 99 times out of 100 or 100 out of 100 times. It can't be like a one out of 100 sort of deal. And right? so this has to be indicative of how he would typically behave, his habits, how he'd behave over time. Okay? Or as Aristotle would say, as part of his firm and immutable character. Right? So provided we unearth, right, the little Sammy realized that was the virtuous thing to do. And that, in fact, was why he was helping the little lady. And we realize after monitoring little Sammy throughout his life that in all such instances, he behaves in a similar way. Okay, little Sammy is a virtuous character. But you don't know that. If you don't know one of these things, then he wants to say, don't label little Sammy as a virtuous person, right, as a virtuous character. Okay. Now we're going to transition. Let's go ahead and toss that book over there. Transition to another point. Then. And this gets at something I've been mentioning we've been talking about, and that's kind of this idea of moral responsibility. What are we responsible from a moral perspective? What and then in turn, what can we be praised and blamed for? What should we be? Right. So, what in what sense are we more responsible? And that will allow us then answering sort of that sort of issue or fleshing that out within allow us to figure out in what sense we ought to praise and blame people. Okay, so he's, that's why he's interested in this. And so he raises, so there's a, hold on a, he says, human beings, we have essentially these three basic parts, if you will. And interestingly, Socrates slash Plato do the same thing. They have this tripartite theory of the soul or what it means to be a human being. And we'll, we'll articulate that in the lecture 15 video when we talk about the Ring of Gyges, the famous portion from the Republic. He, they, uh, they will divide or talk about what, what it means to be human and, and divvy the human nature up into three basic elements, reason, spiritedness, and desire. We'll flesh that out in lecture 15. But Aristotle does something similar. Of course, he doesn't use those three elements. He instead has three different elements that he talks about. So I wanted to be clear, you know, why are we articulating the basic constitution of what it is to be a human or what it means to be a human being, these three basic elements, because he's you know, when he does this, he's trying to address this issue, right? Um, how are people uh, responsible from a moral perspective? Or how ought we to think of them being responsible from a moral perspective? Okay, so it says on the one hand, we have passions or emotions or feelings, basic passions, emotions. I don't know, I'll throw feelings in here. Okay, so things like appetite, anger, fear, hatred, etc. So on 59, he talks about this, quote, in general, those things that pleasure or pain accompany. Okay, and then two, we have, um, I like to think of those faculties. What else did I put here? Capacities. That's not really this. So don't make too much of this. This is just the means by which we come to experience the first element. So how he defines uh, cap capacities and faculties is, again, on 59, he says, quote, those things in reference to to which we are said to be able to undergo these passions. So it's 
the means or apparatus by which we're, we're able to experience these things. And then thirdly, and most importantly, from the moral perspective, Aristotle is going to suggest we have what are called character or moral states, if you will. Um, so, and what is this, what are these referred to? Basically, that uh, how our tendencies, how we tend to behave over time, right? Our, our, our moral or character, our character tendencies, our propensities, right? Uh, so, for example, one example I give you is lustfulness. That's a tendency that's um, characterized by the, the propensity to feel and act on sexual desire excessively. Right? It's on account of these, Aristotle says, that, and this is from 59, that, quote, we are in a good or bad state in relation to the passion. So what is he getting at here? Well, basically, Aristotle is trying to say that no one ought to be praised or blamed for these. Okay, uh, We have no control over them. They're kind of um they're part of our basic nature if you will as he says we're kind of moved by them right we have no control over them per se so like a hothead somebody that gets angered easily you know that initial anger that they feel aristotle wants to say they're just moved that way they have no more control over that than they do the their hair color or their eye color they, they're just moved uh by those natural tendencies or impulses um, uh, as he says, so this is what that's why he say, says on page 60, quote, we are angry and afraid in the absence of choice, but the virtues are certain choices are not without choice. So when we talk about virtue, anything to do with morality, right, we, we have this idea that, you know, there's some sort of responsibility at, at play, right? There, there's something we're responsible for. But if we don't have any choice in the matter, well, that that means we can't be responsible. How can we be responsible for something we have no choice? you know, in, uh, involved in, or how can we be blamed for something about which we had no control, right? And that's what he's pointing out. Look, uh, when it comes to morality, we don't have any control over these things, right? So we shouldn't be blaming people for getting angry easily, for example. So how do we go about blaming people, or in what sense are people responsible? He wants to say that, let's say you, you're a hothead, right, and you get angry easily. Okay, well, you, we don't, we shouldn't, we ought not to blame you for getting angry, right, when you do, but what we can blame you for, or where you do bear some responsibility, is the degree to which you exercise your rational capacity. Uh, do you reflect on these natural impulses, passions, emotions, feelings, however you want to put them? Do you reflect on that? Do you reflect on the fact that, man, I, I tend to get angry pretty easily? It seems to happen quite often. Do you think about this sort of thing? And then, say, try to avoid situations where you get angry easily or maybe enroll in anger management classes, right? Do you, so do you engage in that reflection? Kind of a Kantian point there too, right? Do you engage in reflection and thus try to mold your character and do something about it, right? Avoid certain situations, change your behavior, right? And, and uh, enroll in anger management classes. Or do you do nothing? Do you not engage in rational reflection? Do you not attempt to change your behavior in ways to, to accommodate your natural passions and feelings and emotions. That's what we can blame you for or praise you for, right? Um, so we can be, and we ought to be, he want, wants to suggest, pra praising, especially the hotheads, the people that are constantly getting angry, but then take you know, measured steps to, to do something about it, right? to change their behavior, to change their habits. They're doing something about it. That's where we locate praise or we ought to. And then conversely, when somebody doesn't do anything about it, right, they just let that natural, those natural tendencies become more and more accentuated. That's where we ought to locate moral blame then, right, with that lack of reflection. So that's what I'm getting at the bottom of right here. Bottom of what is that slide 18. Right. Okay. So the three uh, basic elements of our, our human nature, if you will, what it means to be human, okay, and where he then what where does he want to locate moral responsibility? Here, okay, the degree to which we, you know, what are our character and moral states? Um, the degree to which we engage in reflection and try to, um, you know, evolve or uh, manipulate those habits we have and tweak them in a way that then mitigates maybe some of those problematic passions we have naturally that we're moved by. Okay, so let's move on then to some general reflections on this idea of a virtuous character okay, and what it's going to look like. So this is turning to slide 19. So he's analyzing the kind of character or moral state conducive to virtue. Right? He says virtue is, quote, and this is from 60, 
That characteristic, as a result of which a human being becomes good, and as a result of which he causes his own work to be done well. So there you get that idea of virtue that we talked about in the part one video. Right? That what does it mean to be virtuous in that ancient general sense? To perform your function well. Remember that telos or telos, everything has a purpose in Aristotle, and so too Aquinas, right? There's this idea that everything's a purpose or uh, end driven. And so virtue is performing your function well. What's our purpose? And it's going to be to flourish, right? To be happy, to reach that state of eudaimonium. What does the virtuous or character uh, moral state look like? Or the typical, you know, what does the virtuous character, or virtuous person look like? Well, they have a disposition to choose the golden mean. We talked about that. Right? This golden mean, quote, neither takes too much nor is deficient. And, quote, this is not one thing nor is it the same for all, end quote. That's on 60. And that speaks to the inexact nature of morality once again. It's not something I could spell out for you precisely. Rather, I can only give you what you ought to do in outline form, he says. Remember some of those quotes that we rattled off from the first part. So to reiterate, once again, the amount of food intake for an Olympic athlete is going to be a lot more if they're engaged in these constant workouts, burning lots of calories than it is for an average Joe Blow. The average or the moderate amount of acting fearlessly to become courageous, right? The degree to which you have to act fearlessly is going to be more if you're fighting in a war versus an average Joe Blow. Uh, but you're, in regardless of your circumstances, right, you're always going to shoot for that moderate amount given your circumstances. Right? You're going to avoid excess, avoid deficiency. So in sum, he says this on 61, to feel emotions, quote, when one ought and at the, at, at the things one ought in relation to those people whom one ought for the sake of what and as one ought, all, those, all these constitute the middle as well as what is best, which is in fact what belongs to virtue. Important grammatical point, and so I mentioned this on slide 20. So understand that certain, remember when I had the golden mean up here? Uh, and we were talking about this one I just mentioned, right? acting fearlessly. And we mentioned the corresponding virtue. If you, if you do that in moderation, you're said to be courageous. Uh, and then if you do it in excess, you're said to be foolhardy or rash or something like that. Oh my goodness. Oh boy. Okay. Foolhardy or rash. And if you don't do it enough, you're cowardly. Okay. And so all he's pointing out, I think a good, an important point to make, page 62, he's saying, be careful how you talk. Okay. Because certain words by definition signal a virtue or a vice. Okay, so in other words, don't talk about it. It wouldn't make sense, Aristotle wants to say, to talk about there being an excess of courage. No, by definition, what it means to be courageous is to act fearlessly in moderation. Okay, so it wouldn't make sense to talk about there being too much courage or a deficiency of courage. No, courage picks out acting fearlessly in moderation. And then the similar point, okay, uh, certain words pick out vices by definition. So it wouldn't make sense to talk about there being a moderate amount of foolhardiness or a modern amount of cowardliness right or so no that those by definition pick out you know an excess or deficiency of acting fearlessly okay, so that is the point again on slide 20. okay let's turn to 21 where we'll talk about some interesting observations that aristotle makes i won't put these up here so i've actually alluded to this um in the first part video because it 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 becomes a problem for Aristotle uh, insofar as that inexact nature of morality bit goes, right? And so the, some of the critics want to say, suggest you're not acting, are offering us enough guidance. And that's particularly problematic because, you know, he seems to want to rely on individuals to, to take account of their own circumstances and sort of figure it out for themselves what they ought to do, avoiding excess and avoiding deficiency. Well, if you take the first point on slide 21, that's that appears to be problematic because he points out that we're tainted by our own position with respect to virtue. So if we ourselves are not virtuous, our perspective of virtue is tainted. So how are we, let's assume for the sake of argument, like that Aristotle is right, we have to take account of things ourselves, but let's assume that he's also right in suggesting our perspective can be tainted. And if we don't, if we lack a virtuous character, how are we going to know, in fact, what we ought to do, right? Because we lack that know-how. And as he pointed out, right, our, our perspective is tainted. How are you going to leave it up to us, Aristotle, to then figure out what we ought to, in fact, do? Okay, because we, we, how are we going to self-correct ourselves when right, our own view is tainted because we don't have the virtuous disposition? 
So he claims, so this, this is the point he's making that then leads to that issue. He, he claims that virtuous, the virtuous man will appear vicious to the vicious man. So in other words, right, the foolhardy person, the, the Rambo kamikaze guy that acts fearlessly all the time, they're going to they're gonna view the courageous person as actually being cowardly. Uh, and conversely, the cowardly lion is going to view the person that acts fearlessly actually in moderation, the virtuous, you know, hits the virtue with the golden mean. They're going to actually view that courageous per person as being fat, rash or foolhardy. They're going to have that error in judgment, if you will. Uh, well, again, how can you rely on individuals to self-correct themselves? And especially if you acknowledge that so few people reach the state of eudaimonia, and in some sense, it would seem have this virtuous disposition. It seems like all of us, or most of us, right, are, are liable to make these kinds of screw-ups. So then how can you leave it up to Aristotle? How can you leave it up to individuals to then make, figure all, all so, so much of this out? Okay. So, so, so would say the critics. Okay, another interesting point. He, he says that one of these extremes, if you're going to screw up, one is actually better than the other. It's better, he wants to say, and this is, to, for example, to screw up this way. So if anything, make sure you screw up by acting fearlessly too much rather than too little. And I always find that interesting. And I'm not, um, I don't know, you know, what do you guys make of both of these points? Uh, what about that notion that the foolhardy person is going to view the courageous person as being cowardly and then vice versa for the cowardly person? I mean, there seems to be something to that, right? That our own perspective is going to possibly be tainted if we're, right, we, if we lack that virtuous disposition. And what about this point? So I think I asked about both of these uh, in the reflection time questions. And what about this point, though? I don't know if I've been sold on this point that one extreme, right? If you're going to screw up one vice is better than the other vice. Is that really true? Or is a vice a vice? Is screwing up a screwing up? Aristotle wants to say, no, it's it's better. One of these vices can, can be better than the other. And he says that it's because it, the foolhardy person, the rash person, at least more resembles the courageous person. Whereas this person less resembles this person. And it's not always the excess either. So the other example uh, I give here, all right, um, indulging in pleasures and so on. So like temperance would be the idea of doing that in moderation. Okay, we don't want to completely deny ourselves, but we don't want to be overindulgent. And there he says, it would be better to be, what's the right, what's the word I use here? Insensible, right? To not indulge enough than to overindulge, right? So there the lack would be um, as he says, more similar to the virtue than the excess vice, right? That one would be the worst one in that case. So interesting point, right? So depending on what you're doing, it's better to screw up one way or another, right? I, obviously, you want to hit the gold mean, but if you can't, right, make sure you're screwing up towards the right, the right side, I guess. Right. So I mentioned we'd be offering some, whoops, some practical tips and losing our marker lids. Uh, so turning to slide 22 here, let's talk real quick about some practical tips he offers. It's not uh, an easy process to reach this state of eudaimonia, right? So how do we get there? As he points out on 66, speaking to this difficult nature, okay, it's not something we have by nature, far from it, or from birth. We have to work at this. Quote, to become angry belongs to everyone and is an easy thing, as is also giving and spending money. But to whom? One ought to do so. How much? When? For the sake of what? And how? These no longer belong to everyone, nor are easy, end quote. That's from 66. From 61, quote, it is easy to miss the target, the gold mean, and hard to hit it, end quote. So some tips. So acquiring the virtuous disposition or becoming a virtuous character, that's rare and difficult. So here's some tips. Error, as we already mentioned, on the side of the lesser of the two evils. So when it comes to, for example, acting fiercely, always know what you're mulling over and what kind of activity is involved. Acting fiercely, okay. Um, if there's any question whether you ought to do it, you're kind of unsure, probably do it, right, in that case, because it's better to act fearlessly more often, he wants to say, than not enough, right? In the case of temperance, indulging, I'm not sure if I should do it in this case, probably not, right, because he wants to say it's better to screw up this way and not do it enough, right, than too much, right? So error on the side of the, the lesser of the evils, if you will. And then I like the second practical tip. Take an assessment of your natural tendencies propensities or however you want to put that point. And then if you're naturally a scaredy, scaredy cat, he says, so you don't you know, ever, hardly ever, if ever act fearlessly. Well, he says, aim to act fearlessly all the time, aim to be this guy, kamikaze Rambo dude, aim to act fearlessly all the time. And the idea is giving your natural disposition though, you won't actually act fearlessly all the time, but you'll be a lot more likely to make significant progress this way. 
And conversely, if you're kamikaze Rambo dude who just can't help himself from acting fearlessly all the time, well, aim to be a cowardly lion, and given your natural tendency, we know you won't go that far, right? But you'll be a lot more likely to make good progress towards the mean. Okay? So some interesting tips there as well. Okay, so a lot of interesting stuff at this point. I wanted to, before I get into some of the criticism, criticisms and a quick summary, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, this idea of moral luck, because it's interesting. And it does play, you know, at some point in the semester, I, I wanted to bring this idea up. And Aristotle, interestingly, does seem to accommodate this idea of moral luck. What is this idea? So moral luck is the idea that in some sense what we're praised or blamed for is out of our control. Now, we talked a little bit about this idea of moral responsibility. Uh, can't we only be thought to be responsible for something we have some control over, right? So if something's out of our control, it brings up the question then, should we even be responsible for it? And so people who have spoken to this idea of moral luck, you know, they're pointing out that, hey, some of these things that people have been blamed or praised for from a moral perspective, a lot of that was actually out of their hands. So I can't remember who brought this example up. It was one of, in one of my previous textbooks. I think it was Thomas Nagel. I'm not sure on this, but he brought up a really good example. He said, you know, imagine a Nazi war criminal who did atrocious things, terrible stuff, right? And he points out, but in some sense, them ultimately doing what they did and then being blamed for it, you know, right, rightfully so, some of that was actually out of their hands. For example, where they were born, had they only been born in Australia or Argentina or somewhere else, they wouldn't have... Uh, you know, encountered the same circumstance that ultimately led them to do all those things. And it would work the opposite, too. Imagine somebody did something great, conversely, right? Well, maybe some of that was due to good, their good fortune, right? So he's pointing out, or, or imagine if this Nazi war criminal were born 500 years earlier, 500 years later, then they wouldn't have ended up being exposed to the cer certain circumstances that then led them to end up doing what they're doing. So that's the idea of moral luck, um, that we can be uh, praised or blamed for that we can be or, or, or are, in fact, praised or blamed for things that are technically out of our control. And interestingly, Aristotle seems to kind of endorse this idea. So he says in a passage that wasn't included in our excerpt, he says, quote, a man may possess virtue and yet be asleep or inactive throughout life. And not only so, but he may experience the greatest calamities and misfortunes. Yet no one would call such a life a life of happiness, end quote. And the idea seems to be that you can engage in rational reflection. You can mull over your habits and do the best you can. Um, you know, you, you constantly work at it, and yet you just suffer terrible misfortunes constantly. You're not going to be happy in any sense of the word, especially in a sustained sort of way, but you've done everything you can. So, but remember the measure of who's morally praiseworthy seems to be people that reach this state of eudaim eudaimonia. But people that suffer from these terrible misfortunes aren't going to get there, regardless of how much they exercise their rational capacity, and regardless of how much they try to tweak and manipulate their habits. That seems to be the the suggestion then. So, you know, should we be in fact blaming people if they don't actually get here? If, especially, I guess, well, at least in those circumstances where that seems to be at play, right? So that seems to be a, an issue. So, so we'll turn then to uh, what I would say are a couple of interesting problems with or issues that confront the virtue ethicist, someone like Aristotle. You know, we've already referenced um, some issues here and there. Right? How are we supposed to self-correct? Okay, you're relying on us. You're saying that morality is this inexact science. You're relying on the individual agents to figure out what they ought to do, and yet you, at the same time, acknowledge how we're all sort of tainted by our own dispositions, and we can't tell what's truly virtuous or what's not unless we actually already have a virtuous disposition. Well, that seems problematic. Uh, you know. You're also, you know, saying it's an exact and an exact science, and some people find that problematic because they want more guidance in general, right? Tell us a little bit more. Uh, but you know, a couple other sort of issues, and I've uh, actually alluded to the second one regarding like character witnesses uh, at one point in the first part as well. But we'll pick up on that here in a second. But what about when we have? Um, whoops, this is kind of similar to a problem with Kant's deontology that we talked about, two conflicting, remember we talked about what happens when duties conflict and how do you uphold, you know, how do you, that seems to be an issue. Well, two conflicting virtues. What do we do when 
upholding different virtues doesn't seem possible at the same time, right? Or something something along the same lines. So, you know, you oftentimes hear, you know, honesty as being lauded as a, a virtue. Um, and then like, uh, what, compassion? Compassion as well, something like that. Um, so they're both deemed virtues, right? But what do you do when presented with a situation where it seems like they're at odds. And so, so it, just like the Kantian has an issue with uh, figuring out, you know, what to do when these duties uphold or uh, conflict in our experience. So to the Aristotelian, the virtue ethicist, what do you do when it seems like you can't both be honest and compassionate at the same time? So a significant other asks you, honey, how do I look? All right. So she puts on, if you're a male, she puts on the red dress, so to speak. And you're thinking, oh my gosh, I don't want to be seen anywhere with her looking like that. Of course, you would never think this. You would never in a million years be thinking this. But for the sake of argument, right, this, these are your thoughts. Or if you're a her, right, with, uh, you know, uh, your significant other is a male, and maybe, you know, he's got this particular outfit on, and the same thing, right? You don't want to be seen anywhere with him looking like that. So if you tell the truth and say, oh, you look hideous. No, you shouldn't be going anywhere looking like that, or um, are you, should you do something more compassionate and uh, say you look great, right? Uh, now, I've been told that the compassionate thing to do is be honest, so whenever we wrestle with this in a uh, face-to-face class, right, they'll say, oh, the compassionate thing to do is be honest, and, you know, if it's really the case that he or she looks that bad, you know, you don't want them to suffer looking like that out in public or something like this, this is such a bad example. I could come up with a better example, but hopefully you get the idea. Um, you know, and then it's, you, you got to figure out or how, you know, how do you wrestle with that then? So I've had various answers. Like I said, people have suggested, oh, well, the uh, compassion thing is to be on, to do is to be honest. Right. What is the right here answer here? I'm not sure if there is one, but you get the idea. Okay. Again, that, um, we have these various virtues, okay. And how do we uphold them all? There are going to be some situations just like the duties for the content where it seems like it's not going to be possible to uphold all of them at the same time. And then the second one, I like this one. I've given a lot of thought to this one. I alluded to this one in the first part, like I mentioned a moment ago. Um, so the idea of, you know, how do you ass assess pe people? Assessment of people who act one way 99.99% .99 of the time, right? But then they, I'm not going to be able to write all this down there. The idea is, so they act, let's take the saint, for example. Someone who acts very saintly and, you know, very virtuously and seemingly does all the right things 99.9999% of the time. And then for whatever reason, in a, a moment, they just lose it. Uh, use your imagination, as I like to say, it seems like. Uh, and they kill 10 people in just a rash uh, moment uh, to, for whatever reason, right? There's this egregious terrible instance right in a moment right, 0.00001% of their time they act this completely anomalous way so aristotle how do we judge such a person now right so do you want to say it seems like given all the points of emphasis from the aristotelians right and the virtue ethicists and what aristotle says that what we ought to be the one that we ought to be setting aside is the the way they act in that that one moment that 0.0001% of the time, and instead of, instead ought to be assessing them based on this. But as I mentioned in the part one video, good luck telling that to the the relatives of the victims. You know, the people they killed. Um, is that you know is that going to be convincing? Well, they nonetheless, this person, you know, overall the big given the big picture, you know, they were actually very saintly. So how do we? How do we deal with those uh, instances? And it could be the opposite too, although it seems like those are very, you know, even rare or um, not as probable. But somebody who's a jerk 99.99999% of the time, and then they, you know, in whatever, for whatever reason, in one moment, they jump out and, you know, save somebody from an, a bus coming on or use your imagination, save 20 random strangers somehow and at the expense of their own life. How do we judge them from an Aristotelian perspective? Are they still a jerk, even though they gave up their own life in that one moment? Are they still a jerk because that was the anomaly? And given how they tend to behave over time, 99.99% of the time, they were 
um, jerks? Should they then be labeled a jerk? Or are there moments, Aristotle, that can be so um, significant as to offset the the uh, you know the extent of how they would otherwise act, how, did otherwise act, right? That that long period of time that they act in a completely opposite way. And of course, I mentioned this in the part one video. We we speak to this issue into this kind of point where we want to say it should matter at least somewhat. So maybe your answer to this issue or Arist the Aristotelian answer would be, well, it should matter at least somewhat, right? Maybe, um, look, if they killed 10 people, they still need a punishment, right? But shouldn't this matter somewhat? And that's the idea behind the character witnesses, right? When they, we do have these kinds of cases, you know, the defendants will bring in, their attorneys will bring in character witnesses to say, how about a mitigated punishment here? Because what they did was not indicative of how they behave over time. Or then sometimes people will say, you know, in classes I've, said, I've had people say, well, if they truly had a virtuous character, this egregious moment isn't even possible. And I think that, you know, maybe Aristotle might, could, I could see him trying to maybe defend that. If, if someone truly has a virtuous disposition, I mean, you're not going to be perfect, right? You're still going to err, but would it be possible to have such an egregious moment? I guess that's debatable. Anyway, a couple of other issues that the virtue ethicist has to confront, right? Given that they're their theory. None of these, hopefully you've seen, right? None of these moral theories are immune from issues and objections and criticisms. You know, there's no perfect moral theory in terms of not yielding practical issues and, and conundrums. So, um, you know, it's not alone. We went through the issues for utilitarians, the deontologists, and so too, the virtue ethicists have their their share of their own issues. Okay. So a quick summary, turning to 25, we'll summarize, slide 25, we'll summarize here and then go ahead and conclude our discussion of virtue ethics. Okay. So like consequentialism, as I mentioned on the top of 25 here, uh, it's a teleological moral view. We mentioned this in the first part. It's about producing something in our experience, about doing and not just having the proper reasoning. Remember that as opposed to Kant, we started off the first part video by discussing that. It's about it's a, a teleological view. Morality is about producing something, namely eudaimonia, right? Um, this happy, sustained, flourishing existence. Right? So that was the second point. That's, you know, what is the uh, thing we want to bring about? Fulfilling our purpose, which he su suggests is living a flourishing life, which is going to require us fulfilling our function well, which remember what's unique about us as human beings, our rational capacity. So to reach this, the idea is you're going to have to engage in proper rational reflection to get there, to mold your character, to fine tune your habits, to facilitate that pursuit of eudaimonia. Okay. So who are the people that are praiseworthy? Those who live well. Who are the ones that are blameworthy? Those who don't reach this, who are miserable, who don't have good habits and thus are suffering. Okay. How do you reach the state of eudaimonia? The main piece of advice is in general moderation. Hit that golden mean. Okay, we talked about that at length at this point. So establish that general disposition to hit the golden mean. Avoid excess, avoid deficiency. And that's our discussion of Aristotle. Uh, I'm asking for your general reflections on Aristotle, that first question in the reflection time. Do you agree with him that one extreme is worse or better than another? If you're going to err, right, and screw up and have a bias, is it better to be one side or the other? Uh, and then given what he says, right, how do we assess those people that act one way 99% of the time, but then act a different way 1% of the time? How do we act that way? Or how do we assess those types of people? Very interesting question, I think. Uh, and one that, practically speaking, they have to kind of figure out in courts of law, right, when we have these kinds of instances, seemingly, and that's why they bring in the character witnesses. Okay, so that's our discussion of Aristotle. That wraps up lecture 13. Moving on to lecture 14. Our next reading, we'll go ahead and talk about Buddhism. And I like to put Buddhism right after we talk about Aristotle because we'll talk about some of the ways in which they're similar and we'll see that. So another ancient thinker, the Buddha, we'll talk about Buddhism uh, on, on tap for next next lecture. What are they gonna, what's, what are the Buddhists gonna emphasize? What's the Buddha emphasize? Pain and suffering. And so the job of the moral agent is going to be in some way to acknowledge the degree to the pain and suffering the, the role that plays in our life, and then to offset it, right? That is the, that's the objective. So until then, thank you, and we'll see you for lecture 14.